Hello and welcome to the British Library Food Season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. I'm Angela Clutton. It is my complete joy and delight to be the guest director of the Food Season, working with Polly Russell, who founded the Food Season four years ago and is its curator. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event. It's set to be a fascinating conversation with Bill Buford, Jonathan Meads and Tracy McLeod. Just a little housekeeping to get through before we get started with that. You should be able to see on screen some tabs where you can give your feedback on the event. You can read a little bit more about our speakers and find their books or perhaps make a donation to support the work of the British Library. We hope you might be you'd like to join in and submit a question to our speakers. And if you'd like to do that, there's a box just below the video where you can type that in. And you'll also find the social media links to join in the conversation on other platforms too. Also, there is a competition being run for the food season with KitchenAid, where you can win some cordless kit, a place on the virtual cooking class, and a copy of Canon Franklin's book, The Pie Room. So to tonight's event with Bill Buford, Jonathan Meads, in conversation with Tracy McLeod about their shared passion for food, words, restaurants and France. I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to let Tracy introduce Bill and Jonathan, but first for me a little background about Tracy. Tracy McLeod, a broadcaster, writer and regular guest judge on the hit BBC series MasterChef. For many years, she was a presenter of the BBC's flagship art show, The Late Show, where she specialised in music subjects, and has also hosted her own shows on radio stations, including BBC Six Music, LBC, GLR, and BBC Radio Two. As a restaurant critic for The Independent, she has won numerous awards, so there can be no one better place to see our discussion tonight. Tracy, over to you. Thanks very much, Angela. When you say numerous awards, I think it was probably two, which is numer full. Uh, welcome to you all um, out there and to my guests, my distinguished guests, Bill Buford and Jonathan Meads. Uh, neither of them is a conventional food writer, but both of them are passionate about food and write wonderfully well about it. Uh, Jonathan Meads, when he isn't writing provocatively about architecture, art, politics, sport, and uh, everything beyond, um, is an artist, photographer and documentary maker. His huge range of passions and prejudices is on full display and given full reign in his wonderful new collection of journalism uh, and other writing um, from the last 30 years, which is called Pedro and Ricky Come Again. And uh, Bill Buford was the distinguished editor of Granta, of course, for many years, um, based in London. And his first book, Among the Thugs, saw him immerse himself in the world of English football hooliganism, which uh, may or may not have given him uh, a good background and a good uh, experience for his subsequent immersion in the world of the professional kitchens of first New York and now France in his latest book, Dirt. Uh, good evening, you're both very welcome. Good evening. Um, Hello. We're on three, we're in three different time zones this evening, aren't we? Yeah. Bill, you're in Brooklyn. Jonathan, you're in Marseille, and I'm in London town. Uh, but you know, I've just finished right? lunch. Oh, I just finished lunch. Jonathan's probably just finished dinner, and you're still hungry. Exactly. No, I haven't had dinner. Actually. You know each oh. other, am I right? We do indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've known each other for years. Yeah. And you have in in common many things, but principally for this evening's purposes, the experience of being expatriates um, in France uh, with Bill moving there from New York. Uh, you're a recovering expatriate really aren't you Bill because you've now moved back from Lyon to uh, Brooklyn uh, and Jonathan you've been in France for more than 15 years now haven't you? Yeah. Do you want to both talk um, first about what what drew you to, to live in France? Do you want to start Jonathan? Um, a kind of weariness with London, I think. Um, I'd lived in London since I was a student and um, I felt I'd got the best, best out of it and um, wanted to change. And uh, we, we did look at um, moving into the sort of English countryside, but um, it's great to look at from a car, but I don't think one actually wants to live there. Um, and we lived briefly in the French countryside um, and then moved to Marseille, um, which is a city uh, like no other. I mean, it, it is to France what Liverpool is to England, um, sort of scally. 
and um, uh, fairly fairly unfrench. It's I mean, if you look in the phone book, um, forty percent of the names are Italian. Um, many in North African. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a place of great uh, mixy day, and um, the cooking is wonderful, uh, but it's not particularly French. Uh, some friends of mine uh, who you probably know actually the late Tony Elliott and Janie um, came one weekend and said we've got to go we've got to go and eat somewhere. Uh, I said, what sort of place do you want to eat in? And he said, well, French, of course. And we didn't know any French restaurants at that time. <laughs> We'd been here for about three, three years. And we'd never been to a French restaurant. I mean, go to couscous restaurants, we go to pizza restaurants, we go to um, all sorts of uh, Spanish restaurants and so on. But I mean, the uh, French is not something which um, Marseille specializes in. So it's almost the opposite of Lyon, where, where Bill went to pursue well, his dream to be a, a professional chef, trained to be a professional chef? Uh, mainly, but um, it, it is interesting that Marseille is kind of the, the, the portal for a, a lot of the North African community. And they, if they don't stay in Marseille, they come up to Lyon. And it's actually a very big part of Lyon as well. I, I mean, here in, in New York, the, the second language is Spanish. And in Lyon, the second language was definitely Arabic. And where we lived, it was a big, big Arabic community. It's nothing like Marseille. Marseille is the Mecca of a certain kind of uh, kind of Mediterranean blend. I want to say cosmopolitanism, but it's like it's, it's a Mediterranean mix. Lyon, though, for, for me was, I, I went there for different reasons, although I certainly understand Jonathan's attraction to uh, getting away from the place you've grown up in. Um, I lived in England for 20 years and left it actually very reluctantly uh, to come to New York. And then since then, I've been trying to get away. Um, my wife and I lived in Italy for about a year and um, we're all set to do something else when we had twin boys, a lovely event in our lives, but it was a certain, um, posed certain inhibitions to leaving New York. And so Lyon was like um, a, a great thing that we've been waiting for. I, all my life, I wanted to be able to speak French and hold my own in a French kitchen. Not all my life, all my adult life, ever since I sort of discovered kind of the wonders of the French kitchen. So it was, a, 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 it was just something I wanted to do. Um, I wrote a book about the Italian kitchen uh, and we lived in Italy, as I said. Um, and in Italy, they, they, they persuaded me that the Tuscans had invented French cuisine. And that was an excuse enough, just enough for me to think I've got to go to France next. And Lyon, um, the, the main reason for Lyon, which I didn't know well at all, was that it wasn't Paris. What I discovered was a kind of backwards, slightly old fashioned, um, wonderful uh, food city, mainly where people like to eat well and eat um, economically, surrounded by fantastic um, wines and chickens and cheeses and lake fish and pigs. And we were very, very happy there. Um, we left reluctantly after five years and I envy Jonathan uh, being where he is for so long. And would you, were you both, uh, Jonathan, you've written a book of recipes, which is singular in your, in your own way. Your, this was your, your book before, The Plagiarist in the Kitchen, the book before the, the, the current one. You, you, would you describe yourself as a self-taught cook, as opposed to Bill, who uh, um, obviously could cook before, but went down the route of becoming a, a, dis a disciple? Um, I, I've never worked in a, professional kitchen and I'm uh, far too much of a coward to want to do so. Um, dangerous places, um, volatile places. Um, I taught myself to cook by reading a book called Mastering the Art of French Cooking and um, which an astonishing number of other young 
people of my of people who were young when I was young, which was a very long time ago. Um, it, it was a hugely influential book. I mean, you couldn't do you couldn't use Elizabeth David. Uh, she wasn't a teacher. Um, she was a kind of anthropologist. Um, but and many of her recipes simply don't work. Um, but mastering our French cooking, everything worked. And if you followed it step by step in a very uh, learning by rote sort of way, um, it was effective. And I've cooked ever since. I mean, I cook virtually every day of my life. Um, and I, I enjoy it. It's a resoundingly obvious point that I don't think many people have made, which is that you don't read Elizabeth David really to learn how to cook a dish. You can get an approximation of the dish. You can get what the dish should feel like. But she's um, she's actually a narrative writer. I, I, I love her, and I am always consulting her books. But um, it is a, you, you, you can't get away with, you know, not doing it more than once to be able to figure out how to how to do it. Um, that's that's fascinating. I, 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 almost all all my British friends would cite Elizabeth David, and very few of them would, would cite Julia Child. Oh, Ju well, Julia Child's a teacher, whereas Elizabeth David, as I say, is kind of anthropologist or something, um, and a memoirist. Um, but that the trio who wrote Master of French Cooking all came from other different backgrounds, and um, there's a kind of literality about it which there, there isn't about many um, rice that time. It was, a, it was a long time ago these books came out. I mean, that's sort of a, uh, Elizabeth David's first books came out 70 years ago. Right. Um, and um, Jane Grigson, another very, very good writer yeah. who happened to write about food. But I mean, um, they kind of opened um, an unfortunate sort of sluice to lots of people writing about cooking, gastronomy, and so on, who simply couldn't write. They might have, they were buffs. They, they knew a lot about how to put together a dish, but they couldn't write in some, any way that they'd make you want to emulate them or even go on reading them. Mm. Of course, Jonathan, when you were writing about restaurants, which you did for something like 15 years, um, for, for the time, brilliantly, bri bri I might brilliantly, say. Brilliantly, uh, the, the master. Much missed. Um, that was at a time where food culture in Britain was completely transforming, and um, the rise of the celebrity chef, the the rise of sort of, you know, different sort of slightly avant-garde styles of eating, and the opening up to the world. I mean, you're very you're very scathing in in the new collection about um, about celebrity chefs. Uh, generally, I think you call them something like irony-free nincompoops or something like that. Um, I wouldn't but... use the word nincompoop. No, okay. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Um, wanker, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, um, well, I was very lucky. I mean, I, they, I was hired by the Times um, and with, in the summer of 86. And within... 18 months, Marco Pierre White, the River Cafe, Roly Lee, Simon Hopkins and Alice Little had all opened, they opened at that point. And there was a shift. Um, and to away from the kind of, on the one hand, kind of great temples of gastronomy, which are like cathedrals with carpets. And um, on the other kind of, uh, kind of amateurishness. I mean, these people were were professional, and but they weren't they weren't trying to do um, grand cooking. They were doing a kind of casalingo or cuisine gourmet, um, and it was great. Um, the <laughs> trouble is that the next fourteen years that I wrote for Times, it, everything was a bit of anticlimactic. Um, nothing, very little else came along of that kind of absolutely striking originality and um, brightness. I'm realizing now as you're describing that too that um, that was an extremely exciting time and I know for me I guess I'd been in Britain then at least 10 years uh, it probably is what excited this interest for me that I should go to France um, because it, it was just 
there was a connection to France, or at least there was a connection to, to Europe. But it was, it, it's actually sometimes when you're, when you're in the middle of a Renaissance, you don't realize it's the Renaissance. It's just really fun and, um, and quite exciting. And then when it's over, you think, wow, how come I wasn't appreciating that? Um, did you eat in all of those, uh, that, that kind of new wave of exciting restaurants, the, the you know, Harvey's, the Marco Pierre White restaurant and Gordon Ramsay, had, you know, when he exploded with aubergine and so on. Did you, were you was that part of your world or were you an imp too impoverished as a literary editor? I guess the uh, you out. That, was, that was right around the time when I was figuring out how to, how to develop an expense account for uh, being the editor of Granta. So I, I probably ate at more places than I should ever own up to. Um, although I didn't, I don't think I ate Gordon Ramsay's food until he came to New York. Gordon Ramsay was um, the eater. He was, was he? he was, yeah. yeah, yeah, he was that, that, was that kind of second, second stage. Um, yeah. I mean, Gordon Ramsay is a kind of, um, you know, wannabe Marco, really. I guess the, um, what they had was that, French classical training, which they then uh, developed. And that's something that it, it feels like, you know, Bill, that's very much Bill's um, mission in, in uh, Dirt to all the French chefs, all the great chefs that you speak to in, uh, in New York and Washington, Dan Barber and Daniel Ballou and so on. They all say you have to go to France and you have to learn the French classical techniques if you're going to be any kind of chef. And um, is, is that something that, you know, Jonathan, you would necessarily agree with before, before Bill talks about that? I don't agree with it at all. I mean, if you want to learn to be a classical French chef, go to France and work with a classical French chef, but it's not going to necessarily do you um, any good if you want to develop in another direction. I mean, Bill makes the distinction in dirt between uh, chefs and bistro chefs and so and so will be so, so, so uh, right. Jean -Paul, he's great he's, he's great guy he's a he's but he's a bistro chef he's not he's not gonna it's like being told no you're never going to make it with man you but you might be kind of <laughs> fairly okay with Preston you know um, and um, so there are these different gradations and in France, there is, I don't think there is such a thing as French cooking, because what you eat in Lille, say, is totally different from what you eat in Lyon. Uh, what you eat in Nantes is totally different from what you eat in Grenoble, uh, and so on. Um, but at two levels, there is French cooking. At the highest level, there are pretenders to Michelin stars, and some of whom uh, achieve those stars. At the lowest level, there's Burger King, Hippopotamus, um, Domino Pizza, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the interesting thing in France is what happens in between um, a, a kind of vernacular cooking, which is still uh, localized. Um, you, you come to uh, Nice, um, virtually every restaurant will have the same same menu, same dishes. You go not all that, go in central France to say Clermont Ferrand, and every restaurant has the same dishes, but they're totally different from the dishes in Nice. And um, th there is an unselfconscious um, regionalism, which is not, um, which does not pertain in Britain. And there are lots of dishes in Britain which have a place name affixed to them, like Sussex Pond Pudding or York Ham or something. Um, but it's it's just a name. I mean, the, the pig in question's probably been nipping north of the trend. What, what do you think about that, Bill? I mean, Lyon was the, the the place that everyone said this is where the the old the old traditions are still alive. This is the sort of you know ground zero of French cooking, and you have to go to Lyon. You have a sort of almost kind of a romantic uh, kind of notion of it, don't you? Uh, I do. I'm sure, sure I kind of very self-consciously elaborated the, the romance of it. Uh, I, I agree with Jonathan completely. And in and, and, and reference to your earlier question, I, I don't think I needed, you know, chefs telling me that I had to go to France um, because I wanted to go to France and I didn't know what I was going to find. Um, and I certainly, you know, I, I worked at a, 
a, a place with two Michelin stars and had, has ambitions of getting a third because I wanted to do that. But it, I, what I really wanted was to learn French discipline, French techniques, French knowledge. And most of that is applicable and just efficient in almost any place you would, you would cook. There's a kind of, it probably goes back to Escoffier, maybe it goes back a little further, uh, but it's just, it's just simple attitudes like how, how you cut an onion, how you treat your cutting board, how you treat your fruit, what you do with water, um, it, it, how you use your hands, um, how you organize your brain when you're cooking. And these are all things that um, I, I may, I'm grateful for that I use when I, when I cook at home. But Jonathan's bigger point, which is that uh, France is just a bunch of regions and that is actually the great thing of France and may it long continue. I, I got in one of my obsessive sidetracks, um, which I didn't really write about, or I did in earlier drafts and, and tossed was um, France in the 20s and 30s, which is around the time that Lyon was called the gastronomic capital of the world, was a France that had discovered, started discovering itself with, with the automobile. And until then, there were definitely regions and you could you would reach the regions and uh, everyone was aware of the regions, but it wasn't until the, until the car came along that, that France really discovered the diversity of France. And it was extremely exciting. It's what gave birth to the Michelin Guide, obviously, but also uh, since there was like, it gave, it gave birth to a, a, a big critic of the time named Kronoski who, who, who wrote lots of volumes about what the cooking was like in Marseille and what the cooking was like in Brittany and what the cook was like in, in Alsace. And they are very different. The really gratifying thing about France is those differences still exist. And as Jonathan says, you can eat one kind of food in one place, another kind of food in another place. You come to Lyon and you're gonna eat at a bouchon and the bouchon is gonna have, oof, you know, 12 basic dishes plus variations in all these different directions, maybe 14 basic dishes, but you'll get, you'll get different versions of it. But mainly you go to a bouchon to have a very Lyonnais experience and it's very relaxed and the wine is served in a pot, which is a, an unmarked bottle of, I think, 500 milliliters. Um, and you always have three courses. You always have dessert. You're very relaxed. The service is very relaxed. You often get a little drunk. You sometimes get very drunk. Uh, and it's, it's, you meet someone on the street. And in, and like in, in London, someone says, hey, we, we should go have a pint. Let's go have a drink sometime. Um, in Lyon, they say, ah, we should go to, we, let's go to eat a canal. Let's go, let's go to a bouchon and eat a canal. Um, and that, that was fabulous. Um, and if Lyon is actually, I mean, what Lyon is, is it's not international like Paris and it's got a sense of itself. And it's got very received practices. It has Paul Bocuse as the Pope who's now passed away, of course. And there is a belief in the discipline of the kitchen and the, the higher reaches of the kitchen, but it is basically local food. And it's real advantage is that you just go a little ways and you can buy your Beaujolais by the barrel if you wanted to. You can go down the other way and buy your Cote de Rhone by the barrel. You, you, get your, you, can, you can get your fish for your, uh, your canal. You can get, you know, you get your, your chickens from, uh, from breasts and it's all in kind of, um, there's kind of a magic number that some historians have come up with, which is like what you can transport in a day, whether it's 25 miles, 50 miles, 75 miles, depending on a river where you're going by, by cart. Um, and um, um, that's the magic of the of the city. It's 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 the capital of it's the capital of the Rhone Valley. So it has all the good things that the Rhone has to offer. And I, I think the variety of France is absolutely essential to what French cooking is. Absolutely essential, and it's fabulous. Did you not find it frustrating that you were cooking this, this two Michelin star food? Basically, that that kind of kitchen, you know, is is like a, a military operation, isn't it? And you might be doing the same thing as you write very vividly about being, you know, put in, uh, uh, you know, in a lowly position and doing the same thing again and again and again and again. And what struck me was it's, it was an extraordinary thing for someone to do who had very young children, as you say, you know, had twin boys that were in sort of toddlers when you arrived in France. I wondered if there was, it was almost a reaction to that, uh, the experience of becoming a father and that feeling that you have to kind of, you know, you, ha you have to be in control. You're the paterfamilias. You know, you have to have your hands on all the ropes. Um, and you are very amusing about the fact in the book, you're, you're kind of a bit of a chaotic person. And you're kind of- Understatement. Uh, that, that sort of discipline 
that is imposed on you just at the point where you might be expected to kind of step up and be an authority figure in the world you then go put yourself down in this very lowly place in a kind of production line where you have no free will you're you know you're abused if you arrive five minutes late for work it's it's just a complete uh it's an interesting are you, you, timing. You're, or are you just abused because you can be abused and why not, why not, why not abuse the guy? Uh, I don't think there was anything that conscious. I think I'm uh, probably the most unreliable patriarch of a family that one could imagine and certainly one of the most unreliable. Um, it was, a, it, it, you know, as a writer, and it was just, this is just one part of the book, but as a, as a writer, um, to go into a situation like that and you go in as a writer, I'm obviously not coming in with my, my CV that proves that I'm, you know, I, I should be hired and should, you know, we'll work on the line. But to go in and then actually become part of the kitchen because at that time the kitchen had just reopened, the money was tight, uh, they, were, they were managing hirings and they actually needed me. And therefore to be needed and be part of the brigade was like just brilliant um, for copy. But as an experience, it was it was hard because the hours were really, really extraordinary, and uh, the pressure was extraordinary. And usually by Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, people would just be sleep deprived enough that they would start to behave really badly, really, really, really badly. Um, what I found interesting, uh, and it took me longer to articulate, is that I went from New York and I, I was in a privileged spot. I was, yeah. I, at that time I was probably a staff writer at the New Yorker. I'd been the fiction editor of the New Yorker. Uh, I had lots of social connections. It, it, was, um, it, it was a nice life and, and I was known. And I went to a city where I wasn't known and really became, really became a new, really became anonymous and had to create myself from what I was doing there. And I found that uh, surprisingly challenging, um, interesting. But, but very challenging. Um, and there's no question that that life in the kitchen was, that was all my life was at that time, just all every day, that life. Jonathan, you've never, you, you said you would never be attracted to working in a kitchen, but, but have you ever done, you know, one of those kind of days that uh, occasionally people would be, would ask you to kind of do a charity event or something and you have to cook in a kitchen? Because I've done it a few times. And I have to say at the end of each of those days, I have been, you know, my back's been killing me. It's, it's really exhausting physical work. I always felt as a restaurant writer that I didn't actually want to know what was happening in the kitchen. That wasn't my job to know. I wanted to know what the experience of the diner was going to be. And almost like no, letting too much light in on what, get, what happens in the kitchen uh, was quite inhibiting when it came to writing about restaurants. I, well, I, I, one gets a pretty good um, feeling for what's going on in the, in the kitchen because you hear the screams and shouts and you hear the knives and so on being thrown around um, but I don't think it is the job of um, I think if you start writing about uh, gastronomy from the point of view of a professional chef you're becoming um, a sort of um, a kind of PR for 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 that chef and for, for that restaurant, um, and you're it's not consumer journalism any longer; it's producer journalism, and um, which one sees in other areas of genre journalism, like till only a few years ago, nearly all architectural journalism was kind of. Um, sort of anal lingual sucking up to Norman Foster or Richard Rogers or so on. And um, one's now got, thankfully, a generation of architectural writers who are nothing like that and like putting the boot in. Um, and um, so I would, I might know what's going on in, in, in the kitchen. I might know about the appalling behavior, um, but it's not something which um, should which I allowed to impinge on what I wrote. Um, uh, I tried to write as a kind of a normal punter who, who, who goes to a restaurant and is not particularly interested in whether the people who work in it are being abused by, by some tyrant. 
I know that, that's, that's, that's rather, you know, it's, it's contrying out of it, but um, that, that's the truth of the matter. It's a difficult time to be, I mean, obviously you haven't done it for, for some years. In fact, you say that you would have stopped doing it much uh, sooner at the times, but they just kept offering you more money to stay. So you, you didn't feel you could leave. That wasn't a problem I had at the independent. Um, That's where it would be, <laughs> the independent isn't owned by Mr. Murdoch. Um, no, I was, I, was very, I was very well treated by the time. Um, I had you know, good relations with, with people there, especially with Charlie Wilson, who's the, the editor when I arrived, the man who sacked Boris Johnson. Um, uh, and was still incandescent about Johnson's behaviour a long time after that happened. Um, um, I, I was, I, I was, as I said earlier, I was, I was lucky, and it was, it was, it was, it was a, a good time. But um, I don't think it's um, sage for anyone to go on who wants to, who, who thinks of themselves a writer rather than as a, a kind of um, gastronomic um, um, guide um, to go on doing something like that for as long as, as, long as I did. Um, and it got boring. And it, it, in part, one of the reasons it got, and I was doing a huge amount out of, out of London because that, a lot of that time I was making telly films and every, all of my, all my films used to take, each one would take weeks. And I would be, I know what it's like to be in Worcester for, for weeks and you know you find out what the food is like in Worcester. Um, I don't recommend anyone goes in my footsteps. Um, you, you know I know what it's like to be in the fens and, and so on. So, so I was writing about places which were kind of absolutely typical of the British gastronomic experience um, rather than kind of um, go-to places which were all the same. I mean, there'd be a certain number of restaurants outside London, which all restaurant critics would go to because they'd have been actually quite good. But if you're shoved down in Sleaford for several weeks, you kind of begin to wonder about the veracity of this gastronomic revolution, which we kept on hearing about. We kept on hearing about it. And um, the same example was always used, Ludlow. This, this food town, and it was used because there was nowhere else to, to, to say, you know, you go to Macclesfield, um, you can eat this, that, and the other. Well, you can't. Um, Ludlow was the only place where you, <laughs> where you get in and had a very curious etiquette attached to it. It started having fun food festivals and, and, and so on. In fact, everyone now has a food festival, like everywhere now has literary festivals. What's your impression now when you come back to, to Britain? Have you, have you eaten widely in uh, London? Because the, there was a sort of, the, the, the sort of bistronomy movement of Paris was quite influential here, you know, and that idea of these small chef-owned uh, restaurants yeah. opening up in unfashionable, you know, areas and cheaper areas. And that, that's been something that's been a real shot, shot in the arm for, for the, for the, food scene, certainly in London and, and elsewhere. Well, astronomy actually started in the early 90s, that's when that, that word was coined, and Comme de Bourdes and um, Thierry Breton and so on were, were doing that. They're yeah, still doing it. I, mean, I go to Thierry Breton's restaurant when, frequently when I'm in, in Paris, but, um, and Comme de Bourdes' place, I mean, which is wonderful, but, but I never noticed that that had any influence on, on on Britain um, at, at all. I mean, it, it, I think it was subsequently, I mean, after I'd stopped doing it, maybe maybe, maybe its influence was felt, but I mean, I, 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 I didn't notice it uh, at, at all. I'm just going um, to remind the audience that if they want to uh, um, put any questions to Jonathan and Bill at the, uh, at the end of our conversation, then uh, they should start sending them in now. Um, I want to just talk about something that, that you both got in common is that you have a dedication to doing things in a traditional way, um, but you diverge around the idea of innovation. Um, it seems to me that innovation is really a novelty, a kind of what drive, not just restaurant culture, but increasingly the kind of new um, food 
sort of culture that's happening a lot on social media. I mean, I actually found myself cooking a recipe from TikTok last night at the um, behest of my teenage son, which I, isn't something I could imagine either of you willingly submitting to. But Jonathan, you're dismissive of the idea of, of food as art and those kind of directional food trends. Um, you, you, you sort of uh, quote in your new book, Jonathan, the, the delusion that cooking is an art. It's not, it's at best a craft. Bill, you're a bit more, you're, you're, you're a bit more um, open to the idea that the grand chefs are artists and that the food that they produce can be thought of and, and written of in the same way as art. Um, I think uh, cooking gives rise to creativity. I, I don't know if I've ever used the word art to describe any chef, although I do have a, two teenage sons who are full of TikTok recipes and I'm, <laughs> um, I'm having to defend their assaults. <laughs> it's uh, like Instagram, know. but shorter. <laughs> It's like, it's like Instagram, it, but shorter oh, right. okay. videos of, that people, yeah. yeah. Um, you, I, I think the, the, the kitchen, making food, like making anything, um, it gives rise to create creativity. Um, you know, I, I, I think of two examples. One, the, the supposed Italian influence on the on, on the French kitchen, that the Italians made, the Italians think they invented French cooking. And, and, and part of that, the, the, the reasoning of it is that cooking was just a feature of the Italian Renaissance. And you had the Renaissance expressing itself in architecture and sculpture in painting. Um, and you actually had less recognized the Renaissance expressing itself in the kitchen. There was a, an ambition to there was, a, uh, there was an amb amb ambition to, to, um, to make presentation important. And the, the moment you had that, then, you, then it gave rise to creativity. What I found in the French kitchen was um, it was so structured that I mean, it's a little bit like, like learning to, to write poetry only by, by, by imitating the form of the sonnet. It, it was so structured that you, you kept seeing spots where you could do something different. And the, sh the chef I got to know at the very beginning of this book, Michel Richard, I never understood him until I went to cooking school and learned like, this is the way you do breadcrumbs, and this is the way you do this, and this is the way you do that, and this is the way you do that, and this is the way you do caviar, and realized, oh, he learned all these things and he, it then suggested something else to him. And I think a genuine, fluid, spontaneous, active creative mind has a lot of fun in a highly structured place. Uh, and it does give rise to creativity. And, and, um, and, and again, Michel Richard, he used to read old cookbooks, turn of the century cookbooks, uh, 19th century cookbooks for ideas because he would take these structures and then he'd, it would produce something else for him. I don't know if that's art. I don't actually care if it's art. I, 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 I would be embarrassed if someone said a dish that I made was art. But um, I think there's a lot of pleasure in presentation and there's a lot of pleasure in surprise. And surprise is at the heart of a lot of creativity. And surprise is a very big part of cooking. Um, I'm more comfortable with surprises that arise out of certain disciplines than combining random ingredients in a way that seems to make sense at a given moment. But that might be, that just be my, might be my limitation, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted by surprise, um, but I don't think that's art. <laughs> Jonathan, you quote Paul Bocuse as saying that a chef is lucky if uh, he invents one dish in his lifetime. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm in all the three-star restaurants I've been to, and it's not that many. That was that was quite the best. But I mean, it was. Fabulous. I don't know if it was kind of fabulous because the food was fabulous, but the whole, the whole experience was really rather extraordinary and carnival-esque and very um, and kind of kind of great theatre. And and the food 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 was good. But I mean, if I was in Lyon, I'd far sooner go to a food shop than, than go to Bocuse or, or somewhere like Leon de Lyon, where Bill had a appalling meal. Um, I, had a, I, had, I had I had I had I had a moderate one there once, um, but um, I don't like surprise. 
Um, I kind of like things being done the same way over and over again. I'm rather like Lord Lucan, who used apparently to eat um, lamb chops for lunch every day and in summer lamb chops on jelly. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very, very, very happy not, not to be, be surprised. And I, I abhor presentation of food. I don't like kind of pictures on plates and you know chef a thinks he's mondrian chef b thinks he's miro etc um that that it kind of appalls me and it's like square plates i mean why um and that th there's a lot of trying to reinvent the wheel i think in in professional professional kitchens um which doesn't appeal but but Basically, you get to the point where you realise that you're kind of old fart, and um, you, you you find a, an almost inbuilt antagonism to um, to what the next generation is doing. You're very scathing but, about Mark Ferra, these oh, foraging on. high yeah. priests. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Bill, you were up in the mountains uh, foraging for bark root and roots with, weren't you? Yes, yes, and and yeah, wild carrots and and things. He's a. Uh, I, I like Mark Bra, but I think I like the theater of Mark Bra, and uh, I, I like his kind of trumped up Alpine worship because I I I I I'm a great. I'm a very very happy when I'm in the Alps, but I, I completely understand. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of theater in Mark Bra. Um, one point on Paul Bacuse, who's regarded as I like, was regarded as like. You're one of the leaders of Nouvelle Cuisine and one of the innovators of French cooking. And I think what Jonathan discovered when he went there is that there is a lot of theater and there's a lot of spectacle and there's a lot of jollity. It's a very fun, fun place. And you are, you're having, you're, you're having the, the high entertainment of, of being in, in, a, in a restaurant that is looking after you. But the food is actually very conservative. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's. I think he's associated with Nouvelle Cuisine mainly because of his friends and anything he did, and and if you look at his menu, most of the dishes are paying homage to some some, usually a woman, but somebody in Lyon uh, who has made the dish. I mean, I, I uh, there's a Madame Fio who who is the he credits for doing his um, poulion bessi, the the chicken that you cook in a pig's bladder, um, and but. What he does do with all these things is that the ingredients are absolutely topped. I can remember when I was there, we had the best raspberry we have ever eaten in our life. I mean, it was just a raspberry, but it was so exquisite. It has beaten every other raspberry we've had since. Um, and then the, the preparations are just very exacting, Lyonnais traditional dishes. And they're often peasant dishes, uh, or not peasant dishes, but they're rustic dishes. They're like mare dishes from the 19th century. Um, and that's, he, he was more, much more Lyonnais than he was uh, any kind of a, a adventurous or creative cook. He really w wasn't a creative cook. He was just was a great, things were executed brilliantly. I think Jonathan- I Remember uh, Daniel, Daniel Ballou uh, telling me, Daniel Ballou's the Lyonnais chef who lives in New York, that um, he, 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 the first time he had, um, I'm gonna forget what the dish is called now, but it's basically, um, um, it's ham cooked in, in hay. And he had it at Paul Bocuse. And uh, Danielle grew up on a farm and he regarded hay as what you had on the farm. He never regarded it as something that you would have at a, at a, at a fine restaurant. He was also allergic to hay. So he had a very antagonistic relationship to hay. And that, that is actually a, a kind of great, fun, traditional dish that I found references to going back, I think to the 17th century. It's a rustic dish and it's using hay as a, as a, as a flavoring. And that was a Paul Bocuse dish. Um, I'm sure he did it very exquisitely and did it. In fact, I know he did it very exquisitely. I know he cheated because we had a conversation with him, Danielle and I later when he, he admitted that he, he used rosemary as well. Uh, Cause hay actually as a flavoring ingredient is um, uh, uh, fades when you cook it. Jonathan, you're looking a bit pained at the idea of ham cooked in hay. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm interested in the, those, those sort of um, ancient peasant dishes. Um, and they, they still exist in the sort of level of vernacular cooking, which, which, I, which I like. Um, uh, the, 
I mean, I like partly because they, they almost define regions as we, going back to this thing of the, the fact that, of France being, being so, so separate, part, parts being so separate from each other. Um, and um, no one, I think, in Marseille would, would cook in beer um, in the way that the part of France called Belgium does and <laughs> the part of France which uh, uh, butts onto the part of France called Belgium. Um, uh, so it's, that beer is like, it's like hay. I mean, it's, it, it's something which, you know, it's, it's there. I, had a, I remember having a wonderful dish of, of um, uh, pike cooked with um, a gin called huile. Um, oil, oil, yeah, in um, right on, on the Sarpotier uh, on the French Belgian border, and for kind of very remote place, felt, felt like the kind of end of the world. That you, there's just one house, and that was an inn beside the road, and you couldn't, there was no, no, no other house anywhere. And they were doing this dish, which they, is one of the few areas, this is before this kind of outbreak of gin all over the world. Um, that they were cooking with what they'd always cooked with, and and Uil is one of the one of the pla one of the big distilleries, or not one of the big distilleries, the place where there are several distilleries. Well, like you know, Burton on Trent had several breweries, dozens of breweries. Likewise, likewise, I enjoy the uh, the Burgundy dish of cooking eggs in red wine, the mm -hmm. Fumaret, and yeah, yeah. Um, they're very sophisticated ways of doing it. But the the more you go around Burgundy or Beaujolais, the more basic the dish is, and it is basically just eggs cooked in red wine. And then you reduce it down and have a very elementary sauce. But there's a, there's a, there's a great, and I remember looking at uh, old uh, recipes like in the early 20th century where they say, well, you know what, you, for your, you take your eggs and then you take a bottle of Volnay and you pour that in there and harking back to a time when Volnay costs almost nothing, whereas now Volnay would cost much, much, much more, but there's a, it, it was this red wine was the abundant ingredient, and and people cooked with it. Yeah, they they they, they, they still do, but they don't use um, ground wines to 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 cook in. I mean, they 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 use you know sort of supermarket own brand. Yeah. Have you both both been spending? Obviously, this last year has been a catastrophic one. Um, for the restaurant industry uh, around the world, but have you both been finding any upsides in it in, in, um, in that it's pushed you into the kitchen to experiment, do more cooking, learn new ways of cooking? I suspect Jonathan will, given that your book is quite prescriptive and purist around featuring recipes that you know from places that you've already been to. You're not, you're not a big experimenter or dabbler in cuisine, fusion cuisines and that sort of thing, but how has your cooking been over the last year and what percentage have you spent of the day have you spent thinking about what you're going to cook every evening? Um, I spend um, yeah, far, far too long thinking about what I'm going to cook. Um, probably start very early in the morning when I get up around about seven o'clock I start thinking what's going to what's going to be going on later um, and no I haven't really formally experimented with um, anything but I've, I've done various dishes which I probably hadn't ever thought of doing before um, I've been using a lot of salt cod um, oh, wonderful food um, and we had very in the autumn they were incredibly good set and they're, they're very abundant and, and very good. Um, but I, I ha no, the, the, the very few, um, I, I've done a few dishes which I hadn't done for six, several years, but I, I, and I'd be very happy to sort of experiment with certain, um, certain ingredients, I suppose, but um, I'd be happier not. <laughs> What about you, Bill? Uh, uh, well, um, I love Jonathan's idea of starting at seven, seven o'clock, thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner. I, I'll often think about it a couple of days in advance, but um, uh, I, I don't often start until later in the day. But with the, 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 one of the surprises of the, of, of the lockdown for, 
for me was I was cooking, I started cooking sort of individual idiosyncratic dishes for their, and writing about it for the New Yorker and then making a video with my sons uh, who are, who of course grew up eating French food and learning French in Lyon. Um, and uh, we've produced a dozen videos and we've had a lot of fun doing it. I mean, Ufa Moret was in fact the last one. The next one is on French fries. Before that, we did one on a passion fruit vinaigrette and then steak tartare and, you know, ratatouille and things like that. Uh, and it, it, that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Um, and that's just an ancillary benefit in, of uh, we're in lockdown and uh, there's not a lot we can do. And we, we've been having, having fun doing that. You haven't put anything on TikTok yet? Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> I've managed to lose the page. Ah, there we go. Uh, so I have some questions here that I'm going to um, have a quick now. So Diane has asked, is the Michelin star, a French institution, outdated or does it push the industry forward? It's outdated and it's an embarrassment. Um, it causes bankruptcies uh, because people get a Michelin star, they redo their premises with the fancy interior decorator, they hire more, more staff, and um, it all goes um, pear-shaped. I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, the one thing I, what I discovered when I was in France which surprised me is how you, once you just get into the vernacular of the Michelin star, you will, you will actually, there, there will be difference between a one-star place and a two-star place and a three-star place. Um, but then it then leads to a, the obsession of getting that extra star and maintaining that extra star. And as Jonathan says, it's, 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 uh, it's an enormous and ridiculous expense. Uh, and I think a three-star, to get three stars, is, is, is almost like ruins the kitchen um, and makes the restaurant a place actually that you don't want to go often. And this is a related but uh, broader question from uh, Felicity Cloak. Lovely to have Felicity with us. She Hello, said, Felicity. do you think French restaurant cooking on the whole is on the up or in decline or indeed neither? Um, I think it's to an extent in decline, um, but it depends where you're looking at. If you're looking from Britain, um, restaurant cooking has become so much better over the past 20, 25 years um, that the gulf between it, French, English cooking and or British cooking and uh, French cooking has, has narrowed. Um, the, there's a huge problem with French um, restaurants in, in that um, it's so expensive to employ people. If you're paying someone a thousand euros a month, um, you're going to have to pay 750 euros in social charges. And so small mom and pop places um, can just about keep going. Um, whereas a, a lot of other places, uh, uh, the cooking will be really good, but they're incredibly understaffed. And the staff are under enormous strain and it doesn't make for a kind of great experience but I mean the the, the um I think I think there is there has been a decline but because of that not because of any loss of technique or will to uh, at all there, there's 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 merit there's merit in that certainly about the about the overheads and it, it is what gave me the chance to work in a kitchen in the way that I that I that I got because they clearly didn't want to hire somebody else and they clearly had somebody who was for free. And even though he's going to write about them and even though everyone behaved very badly and gave me lots of copy, um, I, I the, the the first thing was that I I, I I could hold my own and they didn't have to hire someone. But when, when I went to Lyon, I, I was pretty convinced that French cooking was finished, and that was still the time when people were talking about you know El Bulli hadn't closed yet. Uh, and people are talking about you know, the supremacy of the French and uh, this new gastro explosion. And I was so surprised when I got there that no, nobody there realized that, they, that their cooking had died. Um, and and there, there wasn't any insecurity about it whatsoever. And it, it, there was something very appealing about, it was kind of an almost uh, example of cultural autism. Like they, 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 didn't, they didn't 
they didn't know that there was any threat to French cooking. So they're, they're cooking, at, at least I was experiencing it in the city there, had a kind of an integrity. Um, it was tight, as Jonathan describes. It was definitely tight, and overheads are tight, and the margins are tight. And I don't, I, 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 I'm surprised more places don't go belly up than they do. The, the ones that are the most successful are the ones that can figure out how to run a busy place on a small staff, the bouchon, especially. Um, our, one of our favorite Bouchon, we, 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 we're very good friends with the owners, a place called Bouchon des Filles, which is run by women. Um, and uh, they just have a number of routines where they, they're they doing their, their, their first courses in the, in the beginning of the day. And it just has an efficiency that makes the restaurant work. But um, I, 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 I think what I found there was that it, in my experience of it, French cooking was surprisingly confidently itself and actually probably getting, getting better. Um, yeah. Fair point that it's it, that the difference between Britain and France is definitely closed. But like the, what's ha what's happening with the bistros in Paris and what a lot of young people are doing, where there's been this big explosion of cooks in Lyon. It's there's it's um it's not a state thing. There's a lot of energy, and it doesn't for all the, the the fair points about employing people, especially in Lyon, it doesn't take much to open a restaurant. The rents are cheap. You you could you can. There were a lot of places that I saw which really had two places two people in them only. And there's um, that energy is fantastic. It's much more energy than I would see here in New York, even though New York's a New York City. There's lots of restaurants opening all the time, um, and that was I don't know. That's that's positive. That's that was it was a it was a, it was a lovely lovely aura. Have you both got uh, restaurant tables booked for when we are allowed to go out and eat again in inside restaurants? Where where we, where are your first meals going to be? Uh, well, here Not the sure. restaurants have the restaurants here have opened up, um, and as it happens, I, I am going to a fancy Michelin star restaurant tonight, um, La Bernardin, Eric Repair's place with with, with friends. Um, but yeah, restaurants have have opened up, and uh, many have perished. Many are still barely able to make it. But there's a real feeling here, anyways, of um, restaurants having made it through a really, really hard winter. And um, yeah, I have to admit it was strange because we're sort of have these habits of being at home. It was strange to actually go out and go to a restaurant. We, we did the first one two weeks ago. Um, and uh, yeah, we're still there. They're still there. Jonathan? I think it'd be tempting fate to, um, to, to book anywhere. Um, the restaurant, I mean, they go to a kind of handful of restaurants regularly. Um, and um, one which I guess we like best, it, it does have quite a lot of outdoor seating, um, but several don't. And it's more uh, appealing in Marseille than it is in London. The outdoor seating idea. There's a lot of shivering yeah, and blankets uh, yeah, going on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in all blankets and outdoor heat, it's quite actually easy to do. Um, but um, I, I, as I say, I don't want to tempt fate. Um, I'm very happy um, eating at home. And I kind of more or less forget what restaurants are like. I mean, I'll have to you know, go on a course to get reminded. And has the whole Brexit nightmare made you um, think about whether or not you're going to be staying, living in France or might possibly oh, see, relocate? I mean, I can see no no reason to move back to England. I I, I um, there's so much I hate about him. Um, it, it, it seems um, oh, so a squalid little country, run by a kind of squalid little cabinet. Um, uh, mon monstrous. Um, uh, as I say, I mean, in after I, I interview I gave recently, um, I can't see any reason for not crowdfunding a gibbet for Johnson. Let's snip that one out and put that on the British Library's social media feeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been very good to talk to both of you. Um, and London's loss is Brooklyn and France's gain. But um, thank you for your writing and your two wonderful books. I'll just remind the audience that uh, 
Jonathan's latest book, which is an absolutely stimulating, mind-blowing tour d'horizon of all his many interests. It's called Pedro and Ricky Come Again, and Bill's uh, incredibly immersive and stimulating um, trip into the French, the, the, the La France Profonde in the kitchen form is, is called Dirt, and that's out now. Uh, thank you both so much for your time this evening and being so entertaining. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, Angela's here. Yes, yes. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you to Bill and Jonathan. That was definitely one of those events where you sort of lost track of time. There was so many fascinating strands of conversation coming together. So huge thanks to you all. And thank you also to KitchenAid for supporting the work of the British Library Food Season. Plenty more to come from us. Um, we're here right through until the end of May. Next up, Saturday afternoon, you can take a little peek inside the magnificent pie room, Cameron Franklin. Um, he's going to be making an incredible pie, talking to Polly Russell about the arts and history of pies. That's Saturday afternoon. Head to the British Library webpage. It's all there. Um, if you would like to donate uh, and support the work of the British Library, you'll be able to see how to do that on a tab. But for now, thank you and goodbye from the British Library food season. <laughs>